Welcome to the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and I am pleased today to spend some time with Dr. Kurt Fields, coming to us from the banks of the muddy Mississippi in Memphis, Tennessee. Kurt, how are you today? I am as fine as frog hair. <laughs> and I don't know whether that greeting is the most awesome part or the accent is the most awesome part, but that is a fantastic salutation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I need to follow up on the colloquialism for people who may not have ever heard that, but that is a, a, a Southeastern United States expression, which is a, you're in really good condition because as fine as frog hair, frogs don't have much hair. So uh, <laughs> you're fine as frog hair. You're in good shape. Really good shape. So well, for folks who are not familiar with Kurt's work, uh, I would characterize him as the nation's foremost authority as a living historian of Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, Thank you. So you have, you've spent a lot of years being Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, what got you started? I'm in my uh, midway through my 11th year as Grant, and I got started uh, almost from, from birth in a sense. I can't remember uh, not being passionate about the Civil War. It was just something that, that grabbed me as a child. And uh, I've always read everything I could read that couldn't outrun me about the Civil War. Uh, so it's always been a passion, a driving interest. I, I'm, I'm a history-oriented fellow. But uh, I need to emphasize, too, I'd always been all right with Grant. I, I never had anything special for Grant, but I didn't have any problem with Grant. You know, Grant, Lee, and all the leaders of both sides, because my interest has always been what everybody did in the war, the stories of the courage, the valor, the endurance, the feats they performed, and on and on. So uh, I had never been a reenactor. Those guys worked too hard. They, God bless reenactors, for we shall, through them, see and hear what it looked and sounded like. But I had never been a reenactor. And I went to the uh, 150th of the uh, 145th of Chickamauga back in 2008. And when I got there, I immediately met Robert E. Lee, Jeff Stewart, James Longstreet, and Stonewall Jackson. And all men whom I have since worked with as a living historian, but I had on boots, jeans, and a t-shirt, and no beard. But I met all of these men and uh, spoke with them briefly. And they were all properly attired like their fellow. Then I saw President Lincoln. And uh, Dennis Boggs was the man portraying Lincoln. He lives in Nashville. He does a good Lincoln. Well, like everybody else does that uh, we living historians find out, I, I ask him, Mr. President, may I have a photograph with you? And he said, why, sure, he's got that Lincoln personality. And I stood next to him, and I had an epiphany when he put that long arm around me. I had an epiphany that I, I thought, wow, what a photo op. Because Grant is the most photographed man in the world in the 19th century. Lincoln is the third most photographed man in the world. And Frederick Douglass was number two. But even though Grant was the most photographed and Lincoln was the third there, and even though they were what they were to each other, the team that won the war, there's not a single photograph of them together. A lot of pictures, a lot of paintings, but there's not a single photograph. And I thought, well, I'm the same height, weight, and body style as Grant. I'm 5'8", I weigh 150 pounds, and I've got a moderate, medium build. I'm a body double for Grant. And I'm standing next to a man who's a body double for Lincoln. What a photo op. Mm -hmm. And then after I, I shook my head and I thought, wow, that I don't know exactly what happened just then, but uh, I decided I'd, I would try to portray Grant. And uh, then I began reading about Grant because I thought 
if I've got the physical similarity, because when you look at me, you're looking at green, his, his size and so forth. So I need to speak to, to people as Grant and take advantage of that physical similarity. Then I, I realized, well, I need to know Grant. So I began reading. Now, all of, I read all of 2009 and studied, and then I quickly realized, as anyone who, who does live in history, I, I had to, to go deeper than just extensive reading. I had to study. It became a study, and there's a difference between reading and study. And uh, so I studied for a year, and I made my first appearance as General Grant at uh, Fort Donaldson in 2010, February of 2010. And uh, I have been doing Grant ever since. But that's, that's how I got into it and, and my introduction to Grant at a much deeper level than what most folks ever get into. And when you talk about portraying Grant from a first person, that's a much different thing than studying and reading up so that you can talk about him. You have to talk as him. What's, what's that challenge? The, the challenge is the, the consistent reading. Uh, you, you've got to read everything that, if you can, everything that he ever said, everything from the memoirs to uh, Young's books about Grant's tour around the world and things he said in interviews to, because you, you quickly realize I've got to think like Grant. And if I, I can't put words in the man's mouth. So if I'm asked a question and I know the background of what Grant, how he felt about the issue, the question, uh, of what he said about it, then I can formulate an answer that is something he would have said. Uh, but you've got to be careful as a living historian, though, because you can't be a fill-in-the-blank historian. If you don't know, you need to say, I don't know, but I'll get back with you. Because I've been asked questions before that I, I have to say, well, you, you've asked me something that I don't know, but I always find out and get back with the person that asked the question. But there's a pressure that you've got to read everything about the man so you get a feel for how he was. For example, he's described as talking in uh, slowly in measured tones in a baritone voice. He had the most melodic voice I ever heard. And that Horace Porter said that about him. Uh, and countenance and posture He's characterized as being a short man, but he was 5'8". The average man in the war was 5'6". So Grant, even though he's characterized as short, was really two inches taller than half the army. But he walked in a stooped over form, and he always had his hands, at least one hand, usually I think the left hand, in his pocket because he's holding a cigar with his right. But he walked stooped over. He's described uh, as when he's working in, a, in an office and he's got two tables, he would go picture Groucho Marx walking with that Groucho Marx bent over strut that he would have. Grant would not straighten up as he walked from desk to table and back to desk. He was described as he would turn around and walk bent over, get what he wanted and go back. So things like that, uh, developed the image of Grant being a short man, but he walked stooped shouldered and uh, uh, he always had his hands in his pockets. In fact, there's a statue in, in Galena, Illinois that shows him, I think his right hand is in his pocket. And when it was unveiled, Julia teared up and said, that's him, his hand is in his pocket. He yeah. always had his hands in his pockets. And that's the most unmilitary posture or stance that one can have when one is in uniform. But Grant was a very unmilitary military man. 
Yeah, he talked about how the military life, you know, when he went to West Point, didn't really even suit him, you know, and it was something that had to kind of grow on him. He, he said that the, the military life held no charms for me. <laughs> now, I suspect, too, that it's, it has to be a moving target because the grant of Fort Donaldson, you know, to use your example from earlier, has got to be different than the grant who goes around the world with Alfred Young. And so the evolution of the man over time must be a challenge in itself as a living historian as well. The evolution uh, is as, as uh, rapid as was his rise in rank. The, the issue of a couple of things about unconditional surrender grant and Fort Donaldson. Unconditional surrender, no terms, but he, uh, unconditional, I propose, immediately move upon your works. Well, you, you've got to look back and think. It was like, it's something akin to the dog catching the car. <laughs> okay, I've got an army of 17,000 men that I've captured. What do I do with them? Uh, got uh, the, the notice from Buckner, I want to surrender, and Grant said, well, actually, Charles Ferguson Smith said, you've got a note from Buckner, uh, and, and he read it, and he, he said, well, what do you want? And Smith said, who had been his commandant of, of cadets when he was at the academy, uh, they want uh, commissioners to negotiate a surrender. And you've also got to picture a, a physical thing. Grant is seated, and he's looking up at Ferguson Smith, who was well over six feet tall, he was like a praying mantis type of structure. And he's looking down at Grant. So you got this thing like this. And Grant said, well, what do you think? And Smith said, bah, no terms to the damned rebels, but unconditional surrender. And Grant said, I like that. Bring me pencil and paper. So the unconditional surrender comes from Charles Ferguson Smith, his old commandant, but also no one had had an army surrender to them. What do you do with them? And so, it, and remember now, the war is only 10 months old. I mean, April of 61 to February, mid-February of, uh, of 62, the war is only a few months old. Nobody's ever done anything like this. And the best path to take is unconditional surrender. That, that is good for the, the upper structure in the command. Uh, I, I can't go wrong with unconditional surrender. And of course he gets the nickname, but he was anything but unconditional surrender. Look at Pemberton, he, he paroled 30,000 men and took a lot of criticism for it, but he, he wanted to get back in the field. He didn't want to go into garrison duty while Porter transported prisoners up the river to prison camps. So Grant says, well, he thinks I'll patrol them, uh, parole them and send them home. Most of them have seen the elephant. They won't get back into the service. Well, they called that one wrong because most of them did get back into service, but uh, he, he paroled them. He let them march in in formation. They stacked arms and marched out in formation with the bands playing and with Lee. Of course, we all know what he did with Lee and the terms of surrender because, and see now the maturity from Simon Buckner, an old friend, good friend, unconditional surrender, first year of the war to fourth year of the war, Robert E. Lee and wanting the healing. You know, he, he was, he says, I had no thought of what I would write until I put pencil to paper, but it's, it, that, that's a, uh, to, to slip time. That's a Neil Armstrong parallel because you know Neil Armstrong spent many hours thinking what he was going to say when he put that foot on the moon. It wasn't a spontaneous utterance. So Grant had given thought to what he was going to write with Lee because he'd been saying the, the end can't be much longer. So he Lincoln had said, let him up easy. And that's exactly what he did. And of course, you have to think too, after Lincoln is assassinated, Sherman gave essentially the same terms to Joe Johnston. And, and he wound up being castigated as a traitor in the papers for being so generous 
with Lincoln gone, the terms that Grant gave Lee weren't as acceptable anymore. But he, he matured and he grew. He, he's the first American general who uh, decided, I'm not in the real estate business. I don't need nor do I want to control and garrison area, square miles. Uh, Halleck, no war, never fire a shot. You just squeegee the enemy out of the area. Uh, Grant, early on, had the, as a part of his personality, Grant had the, the uh, drive, uh, if you cut the head off a snake, the snake dies. So you don't need to worry about the whole snake. I don't want to garrison the entire southeastern United States. I'm going after the armies. They're the ones making the war. And he was correct in that. He was the first American general to do many things, but he's the first one to depart from that. We're going to occupy territory and defeat the enemy like that. So his maturation process, I think, is visible, uh, very visible, as he rose in rank. How do you see Grant changing from General Grant to President Grant, which again is a huge, huge step that he has to make? Well, there are those who would tell you he didn't do that well. Uh, I think he did. Uh, um, the world of politics is a completely different world from the world of the military. And Grant had, uh, I think it's a it's a weakness. I don't, I've never characterized it as a character flaw that he trusted people too well and too long, long after he should not have trusted them, like Orville Babcock, who betrayed him twice. Uh, he, he, he thought people, <clears throat> I think if he had articulated it, he would have said, I think people are as good as I am. Grant was a, as honest as it is possible to be. He was totally without guile. He was honest, of good character, and he expected the people around him to conduct themselves as such. But when he got into that political arena, he was a babe in the woods. Now, he was a fast learner. He was a really fast learner. But he, uh, for example, appointing his cabinet members, uh, he was given a list of cabinet appointees by uh, Sumner and Stevens, and he tells them, I've already appointed my cabinet. And he, and he made some less than good decisions with that first cabinet. And it was there that he began the log rolling and the diplomatic footwork in the political arena. And he was a very apt student. But the issue I think that we need to keep in mind with Grant, Grant had agonized through four years of an abomination of reconstruction under Andrew Johnson. And Grant was a champion for the former slaves. He's our, he became our first civil rights president. And he, he killed the Klan. In 74, I think it was, he had the three enabling acts passed. He crushed the Klan and it did not reappear until the 1920s, and it was a totally different organization then. But Grant defeated the Klan, declared martial law in a number of counties. Uh, he had a, a several hundred civil rights convictions from a few months up into life imprisonment for leaders of the Klan and uh, violence in the South. But he was and his Indian policy was failed because the onslaught going out west was was pushing the Indians out of the way and he never he was never able to bring about the the conditions for the Native Americans that he wanted to. So that was he regretted that that was a failed mission. But he became adroit at politics by the second term and and through the mid and end of the second term. He could have easily had a third term if he'd wanted it, but he didn't, in those days, you, you didn't go to the floor of the convention. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was still in the era where you did not campaign. It was 
bad manners to say, vote for me. But if he had wanted that third term, I think he would have easily gotten a third term, but he declined to go to the floor. Uh, his round the world tour, he, he became our first presidential diplomat and uh, a citizen of a larger commonwealth, Edwina Campbell wrote a, an excellent book. Let me, let me stress her book, Citizen of a Larger Commonwealth, and that's about his round the world tour post-presidency. Charles W. Calhoun, back in 17, wrote, uh, published the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, the first analysis of his presidency in a genera two generations. And then Paul Cahan has also come out here in the recent past with another good book on Grant's presidency. Mm -hmm. So all three of those people wrote books that are very insightful to Grant. But Edwina Campbell uh, stressed that she wrote the book because she said, and she's a retired foreign service diplomat. And uh, she said, you know, I saw the picture at White Haven of uh, Grant on the deck of a United States warship. And she said, I knew that even then there was something going on because the United States Navy, not even for a, a, a former president, is in the tourist business. And when Grant got to England, his reception was so astounding that it gets back to uh, Washington and they start to say, or Rutherford Hayes starts to say, he sends out messages to all of the United States diplomats. If, if uh, President Grant comes to your area, you will treat him with the utmost courtesy and so forth. And the question came up about meeting with Queen Victoria at the Court of St. James. They didn't, Queen Victoria really didn't want to meet with him. Mm. And the, the diplomats get together and they said, because an ex-president had never visited anybody like that. It was all new. And they're all looking at each other diplomatically saying, well, what do we do now? <laughs> and the British were going to blow him off. And uh, the diplomat, and I, his name slips me right now, the American ambassador, but he said, you should treat him with the utmost courtesy as if he were still a sitting president. And they did. So he, he saw Queen Victoria and he goes around the world. And by the time he leaves England, he goes into France and Germany meeting with Bismarck and, and every, every leader, anybody, everybody who was anybody wanted to meet with General Grant. By that time, his trip had morphed into a diplomatic uh, mission. He was laying groundwork for American diplomacy that lasted well into the 20th century. Uh, even mediated a conflict between uh, Japan and China. They ignored it, but he uh, worked out a, an agreement that would have worked if they tried it. So he grew so fast, so much. By the time he got to England, he's out of, the, out of eight years in the White House and he's over there in England and the man who had stood up before he took the, the uh, presidency and said, I'm not a public speaker, I'm not accustomed to public speaking, was a very articulate man and represented the United States well. And let's go back to the third party potential. As and Edwina Campbell lifts this up in her book, she said, you know, everybody, all these leaders around the world, uh, wanted clamored to meet with Grant, the man who'd won the war. But they also, not only did they think they were meeting with an ex-president, they thought they were meeting with the next president, mm -hmm. which lent even more weight and uh, dignity to their meeting with him. Mm -hmm. So uh, his growth from uh, being Captain Grant working in his daddy's leather shop in Galena, Illinois, to Colonel Grant, to General Grant, to Major General Grant, Lieutenant General Grant, General of the Army Grant, President Grant. And he does all this in what, 12 years? So 
his it's a, a, a rate of growth, something I think akin to aviation. You know, when you think about in, in December of 1903, we had a 12 second power flight. And then in July of 69, less than 66 years later, we put a man on the moon and bring him back. Now that's explosive technology and growth. And Grant did the same thing as a military leader and as a politician, but he trusted people to do what they ought to do. And absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. I always wish that he'd had the opportunity to write about his presidency and about his round the world trip. Of course, he, of course, he literally ran out of time up against the deadline uh, as he was writing his memoirs. Um, what, what do you wish you could have seen him uh, write about that period? Or, or is there some other portion that you wish he had been able to spend a little bit more time writing about? I would, I would like for him to have written more about the meeting with Lee <clears throat> at Appomattox and the, the last year of the war he has intimated in some of his writings that once he got that lieutenant general's commission and was then given command of all United States forces, he said, at last, I've got all the reins in my hand and I can move them in unison and we can stop fighting many wars, M-I-N-I, -I, many wars, and we can have a concerted movement against which the rebels cannot resist. We will form a juggernaut they can't resist. And I would like to have him say more about that, about once he ascended unto the right hand and had that authority to hear more about what he was thinking. Uh, let, me, let me quote Chuck Calhoun, Dr. Charles Calhoun with his uh, uh, the pre presence of Ulysses S. Grant because he articulated it to me very well. I had the privilege of meeting him and uh, I said, you disenfranchised me of two beliefs about Grant. I thought, I've always thought he was glad to get out of the White House and did not enjoy being president. And Charles Calhoun said, oh no, he, he thoroughly enjoyed being president. It, it's obvious he enjoyed being the president. And I said, and also, I, I didn't think uh, he wanted a third term. And Calhoun says, yes, he did. He very much wanted a third term, but his ethics kept him from going for, for it. But the, uh, I said, why didn't he write about the presidency in his memoirs? Because that, that gives foundation to he didn't enjoy being president. Mm -hmm. And Charles Calhoun said, no, because think about it, Kurt. Why was Grant writing the memoirs? Because he was broke. Actually, he was, I, th I think about what in our dollars would be about a million dollars in debt. Mm -hmm. he, and no income, he was dying, and Julia had to have an income. That's the only reason he agreed to write anything, and th that got into the memoirs. So he knew He'd already been diagnosed with terminal cancer before he actually started writing the memoirs as memoirs in November of 1884. So his throat is already about twice its normal size. He's having difficulty swallowing, rapidly losing the ability to speak. So he didn't really commit to the memoirs until November of 84. And in, from November of 84, to the last of June, 1st of July of 85, about six months. And he nearly died twice in that six months and there were long periods of time he couldn't write. But he, uh, in six months, wrote 240,000 words, 1,200 pages, 70 chapters. Of the best military memoirs, I agree with Sam Clemens, they're the best ever written. They certainly rival, if not exceed Caesar. But, and, and Ron Chernow, that I had the, the privilege to meet, Ron Chernow just shook his head and he said, I wish that I could write on my best day, as well as Grant did when he was in agony. 
and dying of cancer. That's how good the memoirs are. But in, in talking to, to Chuck Calhoun, he said Grant knew he didn't have much time. He, he, he didn't, didn't know how much he had, but he knew it wasn't much. So he had to write what he knew people would want to read. And that, of course, would be the war. And that's what he focused on. That's why he didn't write uh, a third volume and get into the presidency. And, uh, I, and I, I agree with that because he finishes them, what, July 16th. He has his last photograph made there on the porch at McGregor Cottage on, on the 19th, and he died on the 23rd. So he, he skidded right up to the finish line. And he had willed himself, I think, to live. But he didn't write about the presidents because, not because he didn't want to, because he, he didn't think he had time. And I, I see the notes that he writes to people around him saying that, you know, I'd write more about Spotsylvania. I'd write more about Cold Harbor, but I'm just running out of time. You know? and running out of time. And, and he, he had to put down what he thought people would write. But he told Sam Clemens, nobody's going to want to read anything that I write. Yeah. Lemons went. Go ahead. He was wrong indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the largest selling book, I, I think, until this day in the history of publishing that was a bestseller before publication, yeah. Yeah. which goes back to what uh, he agreed to with Clemens, because Clemens wanted to give him an out to give him fifty thousand dollars and grant said no because grant remember had lost everything and everybody in his family who had all invested in grant and ward so he said i can't let you risk your money on something i do nobody's going to want to read what i write so clemens rejoined and said how about if we sell your book in a subscription format and that way general nobody there's not a book published that's not already bought and only then did grant agree he said all right now i can i can go with that so and i didn't realize until i i was reading uh, uh, grant and twain uh, the men in the memoirs that uh, all of clemens books were sold in publication of uh, subscription you couldn't buy them in a bookstore which were very far and few between then. But uh, all of his books were subscription sales. And that's how he put out the uh, memoirs. And you could get them in four bindings. So as you have spent time immersing yourself in Grant, um, what have you come to appreciate about him? I appreciate his sense of humor. Grant had the best sense of humor and that doesn't come through it didn't to me until i i began as i said earlier in the interview i began to study him grant had a very dry sense of humor and a very strong sense of humor uh and he was described and the first time I read this, I, I thought, I, I can't see Grant in this light at all. But he was described as being the life of the party behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with close friends, I thought party where Ulysses S. Grant is the life of the party. You need to find another party because it's not going well. <laughs> uh, but you know, that was when early on in my career about reading. The more I studied him, the more I embraced that. Grant had such a wonderful sense of humor. And I'll give you an anecdote. As they're going through Missouri, uh, he was a freshly minted general. They're moving through Missouri, and he's sending men after Hardy in a foray out of Arkansas into Missouri. And now this is, we're talking late summer, early fall of 61. And Grant is moving with his staff and they stop at a farmhouse and he he gets off his horse and and asks the lady a uh, mrs selvage uh would there be any chance that that my staff and i could get something to eat and she 
snarled at him and said, well, there might be if Ulysses S. Grant hadn't come through here and eaten everything in the house. And Grant said, indeed, General Grant was here? And she said, yes, he was. Him and all the rest of them, his staff with him, they eat everything in the house, everything I had except one pie. I got one pumpkin pie and I hid it, but they ate everything else. So no, I can't get anything else. And Grant said, okay, but you still got that pie. And she said, yes, I do. And he flipped her a half dollar. He said, hold on to that pie. There's going to be somebody by here before long to get that pie. Can you do that? And she said, well, yeah, 50 cents at that time was big money. So they got into camp shortly thereafter. This was in mid afternoon. And the call went out for a dress review. Now, this was astonishing, doubly so because Grant, General Grant, Colonel Grant, now General Grant, wants a dress review. He doesn't like that kind of thing. And we're on the march. Who has a dress review in formation when you're on the march? So they all form. One of Grant's staff goes out and he reads the orders and the orders are preserved, but to paraphrase them, he said, <laughs> by order of the general commanding, uh, Lieutenant Wycliffe, of, and names him, of the Indiana Cavalry, but he didn't name the, that, that's not preserved, that I've been able to find, but Lieutenant Wycliffe, having eaten everything in the home of Mrs. Selby, except one pumpkin pie, will take an escort of 100 cavalry return to Mrs. Selvidge's home where and he will sit and eat that pie. <laughs> and dismissed. And so the lieutenant, the, I suspect a much stung lieutenant who had impersonated his commanding officer, he took a hundred men and they go to the Selvidge home and he sat there and ate that pie. That's all that was said about it. And that is so beautiful. And that is such an instructive event, anecdote in Grant and who he was, his sense of humor, and what kind of a leader he was. Because now see, obviously he could have really taken that Lieutenant to task, but he didn't. And the word got out through that, that action that the, the general ain't nobody to mess with but he's got a good sense of humor. He's a good egg. Just don't cross him. And that I think illustrates his, his fundamental persona in leadership. He could have slammed him, but he didn't. He used the, the iron hand in the velvet glove with a sense of humor. And, uh, I love his sense of humor. And another aspect about him, Chris, I like is his quiet determination. He, he never let go. As Lee said, after the war, we thought that Richmond with its defenses of our, our hardened veterans could never be taken. But yet when General Grant turned his face to Richmond, he never turned it away until it was his. And that in one sentence is Grant's leadership and how he, he went from the pie in 61 to never turning his face from Richmond until it was his. And in the quote from General Lee. So his leadership, his, his unswerving determination, he never, he never changed his goal. Now he changed how we got to the goal, the plan, is fluid, the goal is fixed. And, and I think he, he's stellar in demonstrating that time and again. You, you've talked about his humor, his leadership. Earlier you talked about his tendency to trust people maybe more than he should have or longer than he should have. Um, so much of what you do is focused on getting past the marble figure and mm -hmm. make him accessible by bringing out, you know, the good and the bad, the human. Um, tell me a little bit more about that, that part of your mission as a living historian to make Grant. <clears throat> well, I am, I'm always quick to say 
that I am a grant enthusiast, but I'm not a grant apologist. The man had his faults. He trusted people, particularly in the political arena, more than he should have. And he made mistakes, but he, he learned from them. There's the, the controversy about Lou Wallace at Shiloh and about the lost orders when Wallace said, I'm given an order, uh, but nobody can, Grant wrote the order, but nobody can find the order about come by the nearest road and all of the ensuing confusion uh, and Grant being really unhappy with more than 5,000 soldiers not showing up until after the first day of the battle was over. And he, he yelled the, the orders at Wallace as they're passing on a riverboat with Wallace at Crump's Landing and Grant on his way to uh, Pittsburgh Landing. He learned to be very clear in his orders. He, he once he, he got caught, now in the persona of Grant, when I'm in uniform and talking about Shiloh, I'm adamant, I, was I surprised at Shiloh? No, sir, I was not. Now, Grant says he wasn't. He said, I was expecting that uh, w we knew they were out there, and they did. Uh, he thought that Johnston might attack him on the 9th, maybe the 8th, but certainly not the 6th. Well, this is all years after the fact. When I'm able to, I can take off the uniform, so to speak. I can, I will say freely, Grant got caught badly at Shiloh and was nearly cashiered for it. But the, the, the two saving graces are, one, Lincoln knew that the horrendous numbers were not attributable to Grant, his ineptitude. He knew the numbers involved and the horror that was in ratio to the numbers involved. The largest battle ever fought on the continent and on and on. There's so many things you can say about Shiloh. But Lincoln did not remove him. And, and I, I think that's why. Also, if you look for the rest of the war, he was never caught again by surprise. <laughs> he, he, he learned Grant was able to, to have a lesson and he applied it in the future, having learned in the past. So as he went forward, he grew in stature as a commander as he rose in rank. But so he learned from his lessons. And I think that is a, a significant facet of, about Grant that one should take into consideration when reading about Grant. Uh, he made his mistakes, but they became less as time went by and they became smaller as time went by. That's one of the things that I've come to appreciate about him. Um, you know, working at the wilderness and at Spotsylvania at North Anna. Yes. Yes. How he, he adapts. He's a quick learner. He applies what he learns. And unfortunately, like history really whitewashed a lot of that. I think Grant was, was a victim of the lost cause. And uh, so a, a lot of these things that, that, are now kind of coming back to light about him. Um, we're really kind of forgotten about in, in the fact that he was victimized um, by people who are trying to kind of keep alive Confederate memory. Yes, as you're raising up one standard, the other standards got to go down. There, there's the, I guess in that issue, it specifically there's equilibrium in, in concepts and causes. And if you're lifting up the lost cause, then the winning cause and the man that, who is holding the standard has to go down. If you're, if you're really lifting up Robert E. Lee, then you really can't lift up Ulysses S. Grant. So as you articulated, Grant got lost in the shuffle. Uh, but that, that has been, or is being reversed. Now, in the last few years, he's gone in his presidency ratings from the, the bottom to about mid-level. And I think that with this the scrutiny that he's getting and the uplifting coverage that he's getting now, I'm thinking in a decade, he's gonna be in the top 10 and maybe the top five of our presidents, particularly when his civil rights and his concern for the welfare of all citizens 
is lifted up that is so so dominant throughout his presidency he's he's going to rise in the ratings so he he grew he grew and it, in trying to portray him to show both sides of it to to be it, to be in uniform and to be in first person and fess up uh in so far as you can. I can't do it with Shiloh if I'm in uniform because he never admitted he got caught by surprise at Shiloh. So I don't do it. I, I don't, and, and as a living historian, you've got to be careful. You know, I said earlier, don't put words in your person's mouth. And don't be a fill in the blank historian. If you're asking a question that you don't know, say, I don't know, because you can't be expected to be the person and, and uh, all knowing, omnipotent or omniscient in what they did. But uh, to lift him up and show him as he was. And, and I, I think he was so beaten down by life. But he said, particularly when he was in St. Louis, he said, I always thought there were better things for me. When he was broke in St. Louis, you know, I, I do a presentation or several presentations of uh, Captain Grant, The Desperate Years. And I have really enjoyed doing that because I can see on people's faces as I'm doing a presentation, they're all saying, well, I didn't know that. And they're elbowing the person next to them. Did you know that? Did you know Grant was broke? You know, the, the gift of the Magi, 57. His wife is pregnant with her third child. He is absolutely broke. And he hocked his watch in St. Louis on December the 23rd. Got, uh, I think, $20 for his watch and gold chain at J.S. Freely's pawn shop. So because his wife is about to deliver a child and she's absolutely miserable, you know that. And his kids, the two kids, there's not going to be a Christmas unless he hawks that watch. And so you go from December of 57 to, let's see, April of 65, and he takes the surrender of Robert E. Lee. So look at the quantum leaps. But to show, I, I, I always stress in my presentations, Grant, and I, I say this, and if, there are those who would tell you that I am a failure, that I've been a failure at everything I've ever tried. What I will tell you is I just was not successful. And there's a big difference. The Grand Canyon is between a failure and not successful because when you look back at everything he did from out there in uh, Portland, Oregon, Astoria, Oregon, uh, Fort Vancouver, Columbia Barracks in Fort Vancouver. He tried to, to sell chickens to the miners in San Francisco, uh, 30,000 of them. They all died in round. He tried selling ice. He and two other officers, three other officers, booked a ship full of ice out of Alaska to go down to San Francisco. Their ship got caught in the doldrums and all the ice melted. He cuts wood for river steamers on the Columbia River, spends all winter of uh, 53, 52, stacking wood, cutting and stacking wood alone, and plowing and growing acres of potatoes and vegetables. The Columbia River floods. It's been the rainiest winter in, in anyone's memory. The river floods washes out his crops and scatters all the timber and water logs. They book a hotel, bought a hotel, or at least one in San Francisco in a billiard parlor. Should have been a moneymaker. The guy they gave the money to, they haven't found him yet. So everything that Grant did, even up and, and to and including the debacle at Grant and Ward, even including that, everything, every business they ever tried turned to dust. But not one of them, as a result, of a bad decision that Grant made. If you look at everything he ever did, the peripheral issues around what he was doing caused what he was doing 
to crash. So the only thing that he was good at was being a, an officer. And he, he very nearly wasn't allowed to do that. So he, he's a man of great irony. And he's a man of a, a characteristic about him I admire is he never gave up. He, like he said about St. Louis, I always, I always knew there was something better for me. And even in St. Louis, when they're living with cousins or her cousin, the Boggs, Julia's cousin Boggs in St. Louis in, in rented rooms, that, that he, she's telling her friends, someday he's going to be president. And that would bring guffaws from people. Mentioning Julia, one of the things that, that uh, reminds me, one of the things I like so much about Grant is uh, he is just crazy about her. You know? uh, it, there needs to be a book. There needs to be a Broadway play, Yuli and Julie, uh, or Yulis <laughs> and Julia. There, theirs is right up there uh, with John and Abigail Adams. Uh, their, their relationship is one of stellar love and impact on Grant. Now, Grant, I hasten to emphasize, Grant was anything but other directed. He didn't, he didn't need Julia to tell him anything. But Julia, which makes this all the better, he listened to Julia. She had his ear, and his love for her was so overwhelming. Here's a young man who never had any trouble with the ladies. He was always a, a handsome young man and dashing young man. He never had any problem with the women. But he met Julia, and it was like a locomotive slamming into a brick wall, and he just was never the same. He was temporarily assigned uh, off somewhere away from Whitehaven, Jefferson Barracks. And he said, I was miserable. I, I was ill and I could not determine the cause until I realized I'm in love. <laughs> and so he goes back and proposes to her. She turns him down. First time he asked her, she turned him down. And then he finally gets into her heart. She, he already was, but her father doesn't like him. And uh, he asked for her hand, and he said, and her father, Colonel Dent, who really wasn't a colonel, uh, says, so you want Julia, huh? Well, now, if you wanted Ellen, it'd be a different matter. And so Grant says, it, it's almost biblical. Don't pull a Laban and Rachel thing on me here. I don't want the other daughter. I want Julia. And Colonel Dent says, no, you can't have her. But he, once he met Julia and they came together, they were kindred spirits. He said she had the smallest hands and feet of any woman I ever saw. And she could ride a horse every bit as well as I could. Now, this is from the man who is recognized as the greatest equestrian that ever went to the military academy. Uh, she could ride a horse every bit as good as I could and side saddle. Uh, and she was intelligent, very intelligent. Um, so when he was away from her, he was not whole. And I think in, in the years that I've been doing, Grant, and, and thinking about their relationship, I've come to the conclusion that for me, the most succinct statement is he simply was not whole unless they were together. She was with him. She estimates that she spent 10,000 miles traveling to be with him during the war. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's only three years of war because the first year he couldn't, he couldn't have a wife with him. He, he wasn't senior enough in rank. But she estimates 10,000 miles of travel to be with him. Uh, she knew how important she was to him. And when he's out there in the, the Pacific Northwest without her, that's when he fell off in that bottle and he did that drinking. And I th he never did it again. Once he got back with her, he never fell off in that bottle and did the drinking 
again. So that is a testament to her. To what you, that's what one has to realize when studying or reading about Grant. Once he got out of the Pacific Northwest and back with his Julia, he was he never had a problem with the bottle again. You know, and and no, I don't think he was an alcoholic. You know, the, the controversy rages. He was he says himself, I could not drink more than one drink or glass of wine would make me tipsy. In two drinks, my speech would be slurred. So Grant was one of those people that we all know that when you see them pick up a drink, you think, I really wish he or she wouldn't do that. He was that person. A couple of drinks, three drinks, and he's drunk. His physiology could not handle alcohol. And like everybody from Alexander the Great, who drank himself to death at age 33 after having conquered the known world, he drank himself to death. Uh, when Grant got away from family, hearth, and home, he killed the homesickness pain with pop skull, moonshine. And uh, once he got back with his family, he never did it again. I characterize it like this, Chris. Grant didn't have a problem for alcohol. He had a problem with alcohol. You see, the, 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 those two prepositions, again, or there, there's the Grand Canyon between those because for alcohol, you have a craving and addiction. You've got to have it. With alcohol, though, you just can't handle it. You don't have to have it. But when you drink it, if you drink more than a couple of drinks, you're gone. That was Grant's problem. He had, he had a problem with alcohol, not for it. Kurt, I could spend all night talking with you here because this is fantastic, uh, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, but before we have to wrap up tonight, um, I know other people are going to be as equally wrapped by your grant knowledge as I am. And I want to just give you the chance to talk a little bit about, about how can people get more Kurt Fields? <clears throat> well, I've got, uh, I'm on Facebook under my name, Kurt Fields, C-U-R-T. Kurt with a C. It, yeah, Kurt with a C. It's short for Curtis, uh, but it's Kurt Fields. And as General Ulysses S. Grant, I've got several Facebook pages, but that's my Facebook page. I have a website, generalgrantbyhimself.com. I, I consider it my, my e-electronic headquarters and campsite, but it's generalgrantbyhimself.com. And uh, uh, my email, uh, kurtfields at hotmail.com. And you can call me, send me a telegram, uh, get hold of me because I go all over the country. I, I, I love to get out and put out as general or president grant, the grant persona and tell people and show people. See, a living historian gets to tell people and show them at the same time who grant and what grant was. But uh, or you can Google me. Uh, I've also got a, a YouTube channel that's free to subscribe to. It's Dr. E as in Echo, C as in Charlie. Dr. E. C. Fields on YouTube. Subscribe to it. It's free. And I put up videos of General and President Grant, and I do it frequently. And we'll be sure to include links to uh, Kurt's information when we put up the uh, the podcast and the video as well. Um, I think I'm first, I was first familiar with you with your advertisement in Civil War News, which also has your contact information. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad to hear you say that. The Civil War News, let me uh, get a plug in for them. Uh, they, they're really great. Uh, Jack Shelton, it's, he and his wife Peggy have been wonderful folks to work with. Uh, and let me wrap up here. Let's see, the, the Civil War Roundtable Congress, if you're viewers and listeners aren't familiar with them, they should look them up because if, if somebody's in a round table anywhere in America, anywhere in the world, I've got friends in Australia and England who are tuning in to the Civil War Roundtable Congress and their series of programs. So they're a good, really good source for the Civil War. With Grant, uh, I need to say I liked the Grant miniseries. 
I thought it was well done. Some historical inaccuracies to be sure. I can see people, I can hear people now saying, no, no, no. But my, my considered opinion of, of it was, I think the man who portrayed Grant did a good job. I think that while there were historical inaccuracies, it lifted Grant up in a very positive light to a great many people. And that's the overriding driving issue here. Get the man out in a positive light. Uh, read uh, Ron White's book, American Ulysses, Ron Chernow's book, Grant, uh, Chuck Calhoun's book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, Paul Cahan's book, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, Edwina Campbell's book, Citizen of Greater Commonwealth, uh, and there's always Bruce Catton. <laughs> Read Bruce Catton and the, the trilogy that he did uh, with Lloyd Lewis uh, about Captain Sam Grant, Grant Moves South, and Grant Takes Command. And those books will give you a really good insight. And, and the memoirs, the annotated memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant that's put out by the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library at Mississippi State. And look up the Ulysses S. Grant Boyhood Home in Georgetown, Ohio. I'm their official grant, and they've maintained the home that he grew up in just really nicely. Uh, uh, really wonderful site, actually, very wonderful site. So I'm going to just toss your name in there as we've talked about sort of this grant renaissance, and you've rattled off some great books there. Uh, I'm going to toss your name in among those folks who are helping to reinvigorate and, and uh, help people reappreciate Ulysses S. Grant. You've just been a fantastic addition to the field. Thank you, Chris. So thank you so much for taking some time to join us today, Kurt. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you. Um, on behalf of all, all of us here at Emerging Civil War, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm Chris Mikowski, and we will see you online and on the battlefield.